Welcome to Outlook, the home of extraordinary personal stories. Podcasts from the BBC World Service are supported by advertising. Hi, this is Melissa Clark from New York Times Cooking. Who doesn't love a simple one-pan meal? Take my shakshuka with feta recipe, for instance. In a single skillet, you get perfectly cooked eggs nestled in a bright and fragrant tomato sauce surrounded by creamy nuggets of melted feta. It's a delicious breakfast, but it's just as good for dinner, and it won't leave you with a lot of cleanup. You can find this recipe and all of our fan-favorite one-pan recipes at nytcooking.com. Hello, welcome to Outlook and a bit of inspiration to brighten your day. I'm Jo Fidgen. Today's story comes from reporter Mariana Desforges, who last year went to meet a choir with a difference. Not one of the singers has vocal cords, but with this choir, they're reclaiming more than just their voice. Tears of Fears are one of my most favourite bands from my youth, and they had a song called Shout. And I rewrote the lyrics to make it more to do with what we were talking about. With choir singing, when you sing in group, the voices blend. You're breathing in the same way. It adds up into a group feeling, and that's quite powerful. Particularly powerful given that all the choir members have had their vocal cords surgically removed. How can you possibly have a choir of people that didn't have a voice box? So it was completely loopy. But it made perfect sense to the doctor who came up with the idea. It took a bit of time and I had to be quite persuasive. But some brave people showed up and they started working with us and they they liked it. This is Ian Bradshaw. He's part of the choir. When I was a young man, I was in a band. Did you sing in the band? I did, yeah. What did you sing? Oh, the old songs, you know. By old, Ian means the 1960s, and he's talking about skiffle, a kind of grassroots music played with makeshift instruments. It has origins in American jazz and blues and was big in the UK. And now it's time for us to introduce the... King of Skiffle. Himself, Lonnie Donegan! Yeah, the rock on the line, the money, good rope, the weather, rock on the line, the rope to ride. Ian loved music so much, he and some friends started putting on club nights in and around London. They booked bands that would go on to do big things. And the Who played for us for four years. For people like the Stones and the Yardbirds. Eric Clapton, they all played for us. So music was a big part of your life? 100%. Ian was also a businessman and was a partner in a furniture design company that was based in Bali. I used to go there once a month. When I was out there, I used to do a lot of swimming and all of a sudden I coughed up this blood. And I thought I must have got a buck from the swimming pool or something like that. So I went straight out to see my doctor. And he said to me, I want you to go to the hospital. And then a week later, he said to me, unfortunately, you've got cancer. My name is Sarah Bowden Evans. My diagnosis was very shocking for me. I'd been having a sore throat. I'm not an ill person. Not go to the doctor's you know, all the time. Um, So a sore throat for me that wasn't going away was, to me, a problem. I was eventually diagnosed with laryngeal cancer. It was a shock. The only option was to have my voice box removed, and I didn't know how I was going to cope with that. 
But my main concerns, I, I have a daughter that has special needs. It was non-verbal. What was I going to do? How was I going to communicate with my daughter? Sarah went in for a full laryngectomy, the removal of the larynx or voice box, in February 2012. Not only does the larynx house your vocal cords, your vocal folds, but it also connects your nose and mouth to your lungs. After the surgery, that connection is gone. Because the nose isn't attached to the airways anymore, smell and taste are affected. Swallowing becomes harder. To enable someone to breathe after a laryngectomy operation, the windpipe in the throat that carries the air in and out of the lungs, the trachea, is brought forward to an opening that doctors create in the neck called a stoma. It's covered by a heat moisture exchange button to protect the open hole. This replaces the function of the nose to heat up and moisten the air that's breathed in. It was a 10-hour operation, which helped fight the cancer, but left Sarah silent. When I woke up, very, very frightened, because I couldn't communicate with anybody. Nobody understood that I was really distraught. Ian had his laryngectomy in 2010. What was your emotional state after the surgery? Absolutely terrible. I mean, you go into a sort of depression, to be honest with you. You take so many things for granted when the phone goes. You can't answer the phone. If you're sitting around a table, it's all right if you're speaking to somebody one-on-one. On one on. But if there's a four or five people, you have a job to be able to pick up things and talk. You lose all your confidence. After Ian's operation, he felt vulnerable and stopped going abroad for fear he might need medical care and wouldn't be near a hospital. Ian found that even some healthcare professionals were too squeamish to look at the hole in his neck. You'd be surprised how many nurses don't want to look down there. They're terrified of what they're going to find and what they see. When you first have the operation, all around here is burnt through the radiotherapy, and it looks awful. Absolutely awful. And how did your family react to it? Well, they were so shocked about it all. Even they didn't realise how big an operation it is. And what would you look like afterwards? My daughter it broke her heart. Did you be like this? Once I'd come round properly and was in less pain than I was, I mean, bearing in mind the scar for a laryngectomy is basically cutting you from ear to ear across your neck. It's a huge, huge scar. So you're in a lot of pain. But I think, you know, having friends and family around starts to get you back into it. And then there's a whole kind of thing of what you've got to do next that kind of keeps your mind occupied to getting better, really. And a big part of the recovery is learning how to communicate again without a voice box. Sarah had a voice prosthesis fitted. This means a tiny hole for the prosthesis valve is made between the windpipe, the trachea, and the food pipe, the esophagus. The esophagus connects to the mouth. After breathing in, she closes the button on her neck opening. So the air has to escape, but it can't. This is ear, nose and throat doctor Thomas Moores. So then it pushes itself through that small valve, goes into the into the esophagus, and then there's an area just above it that starts vibrating, and that produces a sound, and that sound travels forward, and then you project it out, and you change your your vowels, how you change the shape of your your throat and your mouth, with your tongue, and then the lips and all that. That's called articulation. The first time you can talk, it's like somebody that's blind and can see. 
It's unbelievable. Mind you, my wife might not say that. <laughs> I was talking, but only kind of words every now and again, really, not really having a conversation. Thomas More has brought this rehabilitation class into to practice, and I went along to that. So let's meet Dr Thomas Moores properly. He's 35, originally from Belgium, but now lives and works in the UK. And most importantly, he loves to sing. When you like singing, you uh, you end up singing all over the place. <laughs> yeah, there can be the bathroom, there can be uh, the kitchen, the car, uh, sometimes the tube. Now, the problem with that is that when I came over here, I, I ended up in hospital accommodations. So there's always someone sleeping or recovering uh, <laughs> or on call uh, from the hard work in, in the, um, the hospital. So I, I kind of had to stop uh, singing because I was waking <laughs> up everyone. <laughs> Not everybody's favourite flatmate then. <laughs> nope. <laughs> When I was a young kid, I started singing, part of the uh, the only Belgian boys choir at the time. So we travelled all around the world, did all the big projects when there was a big conductor coming to Belgium to do a production. And that was quite an interesting uh, part of my life. I discovered the power of music. Whilst travelling, you are in touch with different cultures and it's a, a fantastic way to make an exchange of culture. With music, it's incredible how well you can be understood and how connected you can feel. So when you are singing, how do you feel? You know, when you are part in a choir, you forget about everything around you. It's You're just in that moment and it's just an incredibly powerful uh, feeling. Um, it's very emotional. Uh, you just feel happy. And yes, this is Thomas singing with this choir. He's the countertenor, so the high voice you can hear is him. And you decided to pursue a career in medicine. Why was that? We were travelling in, 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 in the Philippines and somehow I, I got in touch with one of the, the bigger boys, the cooler boys, yeah? And it's very hierarchical. The younger kids are not supposed to hang out. You know, they get bullied by the older boys. But anyway, uh, he uh, he kind of accepted me and it, I became his little page, if you want, yeah? <laughs> carrying his scores uh, and his, his bag, you know, that, that kind of interaction. And he was doing medicine. So he um, started talking to me about all these strange conditions and everything and uh, so I remember I was like 13 years old and he gave me his medical dictionary so I was reading a medical dictionary as as my nighttime reading before for bedtime and then I asked him all these questions the next time I saw him and that's when I decided uh, I would like to pursue a, a career in, in in medicine and you said that you specialize in ears nose and throat why that area specifically I Got interested in ear, nose and throat uh, because the voice is part of that. And I had this this background as a singer, understood how the mechanism uh, work. And I wanted to combine both. I wanted to combine singing and, and medicine. So Thomas completed his medical training in Belgium and then he wanted to get some experience working in a different health system. Just a week before he came to the UK, he had a bright idea. I had a friend of mine who was a journalist in a national paper and she needed to write up a story about young persons going abroad to pursue their dream or a, uh, a career. So on that day, I was reading an article on laryngectomy, the, the operation, laryngectomy. And I read like there's a monotonous voice outcome, which is which makes it, it hard for them also to be understood. So I was like, would singing make a difference for them? So I went to that interview and I told her I'm going to the UK because I wanted to to uh, build up the story. Yeah, uh, and I said I'm going to start a choir with people who have lost their their voice box, and they loved the story so much that it went like on the front page almost. Yeah. So having just declared to all of Belgium that he was going to start a choir for people without voice boxes, Thomas got busy working as a junior doctor in England. 
and he remained adamant that he was going to make his idea happen. So then I wrote an email out to loads of different countries in Europe, telling them I'm, I want to start a choir and implement singing techniques into the voice rehabilitation after laryngectomy. Um, can I come over to your university and start training in ENT and uh, combine it with this idea and uh, 40% of them came back to me which is a lot but they all said we don't have the money so that's when I decided I'm going to stay in the UK I'm going to freelance as a, as a doctor and all my free time will be on this project Thomas set up the choir in 2015 five years after Ian's operation by this time Ian was the chairman of a laryngectomy support group at his local hospital Word had got around about what Dr. Thomas was doing, and Ian was curious. I didn't believe what I was hearing. I thought I'd never heard such rubbish in all my life. And before I asked any of my members, I thought, well, I'll go along and see what he's got to say about it. I thought Dr. Morse was completely mad. It took a bit of time and I had to be quite persuasive. But some brave people showed up and they started working uh, with us and they, they liked it. First you control, support, where I'm going to breathe. So you work to that, you breathe, you take your time because that will help you to relax yeah. on stage as well. Yeah. You take your time. They called yeah. the choir Shout at Cancer. And Ian and Sarah were some of the original members. Talking was difficult enough, so Thomas didn't launch straight into singing. First, he slowly started building up the strength of their voices with speech therapists, and later introduced music and singing using professional coaches and even an opera singer, Laverne Williams, to guide them on their breathing techniques and projecting. And I went there and I was amazed with Laverne we were doing sessions in King's Cross and Ian showed up and he was cheerful, yeah? And Because, like, it's the first time and for a lot of people it, it's a huge step to come out of their, their safety zone, their comfort uh, 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 zone and to step out of that into, like, uh, what, a choir, what, singing? What, you must be kidding. And then to see him relax and get interactive and very active doing the sessions just shows that, like, hey, we're on to something good here. And there was a young lady there. And you couldn't hear her at all. And within a month, the confidence in her and she could talk. I was amazed. To get people without voice boxes to sing, it's just by uh, focusing on breathing techniques because the power of the voice is still the air from the lungs. So by really controlling that, by pushing their boundaries, that by using music to explore their new voice, to go higher uh, than they thought they, they could, to reach ranges they um, did not explore before in a fun way. OK, together choir... Only, only, only choir. Shout, shout. It's just for the mic check, yeah? One, two, three, and shout, shout. Okay, and it's fine, thank you. When I said to my son, I'm joining the choir, he said, Dad, you couldn't sing before you had this. How could you join the choir? <laughs> Queen got up, same structure uh, as we do Wonderful World, because it's very fast, we're going to split up, yeah? So it's going to be, got my hair, got my head, got my brains, got my ears, I'm at the last bit. So you understand? Which well, is one, generally one, people breathe through one, their lungs, I know that sounds a bit obvious, but opera singers or singers in general breathe through their diaphragm, so by holding your breath in your diaphragm, you're getting like a, a basis to get a bigger breath out. And that's why we're able to get a whole sentence out rather than just taking short breaths. They let me know me, silence and 
Suddenly I could speak again. I had a sly intonation. I don't know whether you can hear that now or not. <laughs> but I did have a sly intonation in my voice again. I couldn't believe the difference in the way that I sounded. And we did recordings of before and after. With something called the rainbow. When the sunlight strikes rainbows in the air, they act as a prism and form a rainbow. Yeah. So the rainbow... A poem or recital um, uses every vowel and consonant in the alphabet, and we all recorded it before. There is, according to legend, a boiling pot of gold upon end. People look and then after, when the sunlight strikes rainbows, raindrops in the air, they act as a prism and form a rainbow. The rainbow is a division of white light into many beautiful colours. And the difference is quite incredible. It takes the shape of a long round arch, with its path high above, and its two ends apparently beyond the horizon. You can hear in that first there recording is. from the early days of Thomas's classes, Sarah's voice sounds quite monotone and flat, but after about five sessions, it has personality and her southern English accent is apparent. Remember, before Sarah had her voice box removed, she was anxious about how she would communicate with her daughter, who was nonverbal. Remarkably, and I don't know quite how she did it, she learned to lip read, I think. And I do something called lip speech, consonant speech, where I can sound things out without actually speaking. And she understood, and still does. Because I still have days where... You know, maybe my, my valve is leaking and I can't talk. Um, so she will still understand by my lip speech. The choir was going well and they started to perform around the UK, rewriting the lyrics to well-known songs to express their experiences of having their voices removed. Then, in spring 2017... I got an email saying, oh, I've seen your video of uh, you. Um, I am um, a documentary maker. Uh, he said all the prizes he had won, uh, which I didn't know at the time, uh, what, they, what they really meant. And then he said, most importantly, I'm a laryngectomy myself, and your choir got my eye. Do you want to talk? And he wrote right back and said, sure, let's talk. This is American filmmaker Bill Brummel. He had a laryngectomy in 2016. During my recovery period, I was riddled with the insecurity, fear, and doubt. And I think that's common for laryngectomies. A laryngectomies can often lose self-confidence, and we can often retreat into a world where we don't have to eat, speak, or be seen in public. The loss of laughter, I think, for me, is the most tragic part. You know, you can laugh, you can smile, and you, but you don't, you don't transmit the sound. And laughter is infectious. So it, that's a big part of who I was and who I am. But I don't get to break out into a big laughter and guffaw, and so I, I do miss that. Bill had a lot of support from his family, friends, and his doctor. I was at a routine visit about nine months a year after my laryngectomy with him. And he suggested to me that I make a film about living with the psychosocial aspects of a laryngectomy. My first thought was, stick to medicine, doc. I'm the professional here. <laughs> but upon reflection, I mean, it was a very good idea. And so I went in search of a story to illustrate the topic. So he searched the internet, and that's when he found the Shout at Cancer Choir and sent Thomas an email. We had a good interaction from the first time we rang each other and, and Skyped each other, and it was clear that this was going to go somewhere. And that connection brought Bill and his film crew to the UK. Everyone knows how the song works, the musicians in including. Uh, let's do it. At the time, the choir was preparing for a live concert at London's Tabernacle Theatre, a Romanesque red brick and terracotta building which started life in the late 1800s as a church. It became an arts and entertainment venue in the 70s. 
It has hosted Adele, The Clash, Santana and Pulp, amongst many, many others. So it was a big gig for the choir, and it needed a lot of preparation. For the um, Tabernacle performance, we strategically, we did a concert just two months before, where we started working around poetry and how they expressed themselves. So we, we kind of forced them to put stuff down on paper, uh, take your time and do stuff with a spoken word artist. And that gave us lots of new keywords and new themes to be working with. And we put that into um, a beautiful storyline and then we added the jazz uh, to that. This silence is unbearable. I cannot take much more. Poems like this one from Sarah. It's about how she felt during a two-year period when she had no voice at all. This was after regaining it following the laryngectomy. Something had gone wrong and she had to go back to hospital. She had a feeding tube and couldn't swallow. Sarah wrote this poem during that difficult time. It's called Can You Hear My Silence? This hurts. Quite difficult to, to stand up and actually bear my soul, bear what I was feeling to other people. Sarah is incredible as a, as a writer. She's really good in putting her emotions onto a paper. So be thankful for the voice you have and use it for a good purpose. Say nice things when you can to those who deserve to hear your vocals. And maybe after hearing this, you'll know the point I'm making. There are many precious things in life that can suddenly be taken. It gets you, but if it does. Sarah's poem struck a chord with Ian. And most people, when they hear it, first of all, it hits them. It hits them there. And I'll tell you another thing about that poem. When Sarah couldn't <clears throat> speak, one of the other ladies, Larry, would do the poem before we'd done a concert. Unfortunately, that lady's no longer with us. But it meant so much to her to be able to say that. It goes like, pom, pom. Pom 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 pom, and that's it. As well as standing up in front of a packed-out theatre, sharing their innermost feelings with poems and rewritten lyrics to popular songs, Thomas also wanted the choir to play small wind instruments, namely the kazoo, which is a metal triangular shape and makes a buzzing sound when you hum into it. And he also wanted some members to play the whistle. Both require the ability to blow out for a long time. The reason why I wanted to work with uh, wind instruments is to convince them that you can blow out uh, through your, your valve. And there's numerous reasons why. If you learn that you can blow out air through your uh, valve without voicing, it's important for your speech. Because how we do consonants, for example, there's consonants where we use voice, there's consonants where we don't use voice. So to make the difference between uh, those consonants, that's important. Uh, also, if you can do that, you can blow out birthday candles, for example, or your grandchild, yeah? So all those small things, even blowing your nose, a lot of them don't realise, but you can blow your nose. So that's why I wanted to, to push them. We had the example, because we were playing with a, a trumpet player who had the laryngectomy and was still playing the trumpet. <laughs> so Sounds like, hey guys, she can do it, you can do it. But that did not go that easily. <laughs> they really struggled, and it was quite, I mean, fun. It was quite something. But in the end, they, they, some of them really, really managed to do it. Thomas, with instruments that you're supposed to be able to play when you haven't got a voice box, said, oh, yeah, just play this kazoo. And I'm just like, 
Seriously, I can't do that. I don't have the capacity to do that. But Thomas is just so inspiring that, yeah, you'll be fine, just have a go. And I said to him, yeah, that's fine for you, Mr. I've got some vocal cords, but not so easy for me, but I did do it. I did actually do it in the end. Okay, so... Sarah played the whistle and Ian the kazoo. I didn't know I think I'd be able to play one. Simple as that. But I ended up being able to play. The song was the Colonel Bogey March, which was written by a British Army bandmaster in the early 1900s. The melody was particularly meaningful for Ian. Because my father was in the army all his life. And he was in a Bristol war camp. I didn't see my dad till I was five. So it meant a lot to me. And as the Tabernacle concert grew closer, the excitement started to build. Incredible to be part of something, though, where people would come and see it. You know, to... I mean, I couldn't really sing before, so... The big night was the 30th of October, 2018. Okay, everyone, thank you for all your hard work. Finally, we're at the show, yeah? I think we've done extremely well. OK. We are, uh, we are winners uh, already. We've done incredibly well. Uh, it's been quite a journey and it's been a very pleasant uh, journey. We can be very proud of ourselves and now it's just about enjoying... Before the show, were there any pre-show nerves? Together. Yes, of course. There's always the, the normal uh, pre-show nerves. Then on top of that, I'm quite chaotic. I'm like a, a last-minute person uh, myself. And then you, you're working with a choir and with so many musicians. Time and, and cost efficiency-wise, you do your rehearsals, your general rehearsal the day before. And uh, there was people traveling in from Belgium. The saxophones were coming in from Belgium and the, the backup choir singers were all friends of my previous choir. They just showed up. And so you have to bring everything together on the day. Very, very nervous. We were all backstage and it was just a huge thing. Ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome to our concert. We are Shout at Cancer. We focus on the rehabilitation of speech, the speech recovery after the surgical removal of the voice box laryngectomy. And we are very proud to present to you tonight our one and only laryngectomy choir. It's a big concert to do for us. How did you feel up on stage with the rest of the choir? Unbelievable. We've all become so great friends. And uh, every one of them have got different problems. Through Larry being Larry's. But they got so much fight in them. And Bill was there with his film crew to capture every moment while Thomas conducted the choir. One of the songs we worked on heavily was a song of Nina Simone, uh, which is Ain't Got No. Thank you for being here. Our last song. We found our voice, our own version of Nina Simone, Ain't Got No. I, I guess I'm an honorary member of the choir. And in my enthusiasm, um, I opt up on the final encore and on stage and, and sang with them. It's a great experience. Ain't got no chords, ain't got no spell. My brain and tongue don't go too well. Ain't got no call, it's hard to swallow. Gotta have a meal without a fight. Ain't got no choice. Song is sort of a reflection of all the things you don't have. You know, Nina Simone is an African American was singing about all the things that she didn't have because she was black. Then she turns 
and it's, it's you know sad all the things you have but look at the optimism look at all the things that you still do have yeah what have i got then comes the acceptance the realization like this i am happy i'm going for it because i have this It was an explosion of positive energy, like a tsunami wave of positive energy just hitting you on stage. You feel a crowd's attention, even when you're with them back to them. How did it feel for you to watch that? You are in that moment. Yeah, and you don't really realize, but you you are there together on on stage. You you've got, you're looking at each other. You are a, a team uh, on stage. You you're one. You see how it affects them, and then it hits you uh, as well. And you just you have that shared happiness. We Help me because I've met other people that are in the same situation that I'm in, and we're all different, but we're all the same in you know the sense of the operation. But everybody understands what difficulties you have, you know, throughout the day, you know, throughout your life. I think if I hadn't been in the choir, I think I'd have been more of like a recluse. I don't think I'd have ever gone out. I was that far down in my life, in my body, and felt so bad about myself that I think if I hadn't had the choir, I don't know where I'd be now. I really don't. You are privileged to be working with them, and it is such an interesting uh, group of people because you get to know them. You get to know their family, you get to know their background, and the richness of what they went through before and after the operation, and how they bounce back after the operation. It's inspiring for you, for yourself. It's all, yeah. Uh, I'm sure. We made a difference for, uh, for them, but I think what we actually did is that we made a difference for each other. I think the whole experience of making the film has really helped me to recover even more emotionally. The choir members are such an example of resilience and the strength of the human spirit. It's infectious and it's wonderful to be around. I've learned lessons from each of them. Remember, Ian said that after his laryngectomy, he stopped going on holiday outside of the UK because he was scared he would need medical care. But the choir changed that. The first trip I done abroad was with the choir was over in Belgium. I mean, that was a milestone in itself. I was going over there after not going for so long. Um, I'm back at the races, and I actually take the Larry Club every month to the races. You do? <laughs> and they love it to get out and go to somewhere like that. So I take them racing. Where I live, I got a farm on it, backs onto the race course at Newbury. So they all meet at my place, and then we go racing. That was Ian Bradshaw of the Shout at Cancer Choir speaking to reporter Mariana de Forge last year. We also heard from singer Sarah Bowden Evans, choir founder Dr. Thomas Moores, and filmmaker Bill Brummel, whose documentary is called Can You Hear My Voice? Since then, the pandemic has put paid to live performances, but the choir has been embracing technology to continue sharing their voices with the world. Thanks for listening. We'll have another remarkable Outlook story for you tomorrow. Hope to see you then. 
We launched the Global News Podcast back in 2007, and a decade and a half later, it is still the most downloaded podcast from the BBC World Service. The Global News Podcast. The Global News Podcast. The Global News Podcast. I think there's lots of reasons it's still so popular. It gives you a global view of what's going on in the news. You'll hear stories that you might not get to find out about anywhere else. And because we have offices all the way around the globe, you can often get a local perspective on a story, no matter where it's happening. Pakistan. Nicaragua. Ethiopia, Sumatra. And it's not all just wars and disaster and catastrophe. We also cover stories that are funny or curious or unexpected. How tomato sauce is getting involved in the space race. Because it's important that this is a podcast that you actually really want to listen to. And finally, we report on a really big purchase, a dinosaur. That's the Global News Podcast. All the news from around the world, and we might even make you smile. This was really quite extraordinary. Just search for the Global News Podcast. Hi, this is Melissa Clark from New York Times Cooking. Who doesn't love a simple one-pan meal? Take my shakshuka with feta recipe, for instance. In a single skillet, you get perfectly cooked eggs nestled in a bright and fragrant tomato sauce surrounded by creamy nuggets of melted feta. It's a delicious breakfast, but it's just as good for dinner, and it won't leave you with a lot of cleanup. You can find this recipe and all of our fan-favorite one-pan recipes at nytcooking.com. 